Why is it that providing clean water in the Nordics is not considered impact, but providing clean water in some parts of Africa is considered impact? So for me, the definition of impact is delivering a crucially important service that hasn't yet shown its commercial viability. I'm Tatiana Antonelia Beya, founder of Goombook, and you're listening to Forward Talks, Conversations That Matter. This episode continues our special series, Climate Leaders Rising Up to COP28, in partnership with MasterCard. We're sharing inspiring stories of sustainability leaders and climate champions driving impact from our region to the world. I'm joined today by Hossam Alam, who is a managing partner at the Climate Resilience Fund, which is focused on climate projects in Africa. I spoke to him about his journey leading up to becoming an investor in climate projects and his experience attending COP27 in Egypt as we gear up to COP28 this year. Hossam began his career as an environmental engineer at Shell, followed by working for his family's construction business in Egypt for a decade before making the shift to becoming a full-time investor. The turning point was during COVID. COVID was for me, I mean, I was very privileged both to be uh, largely untouched by COVID from a health perspective, but also very privileged in that I was able to uh, access, I was able to escape the city into the countryside and spend a lot of time outdoors. And my children were coming into an age where they could be a bit aware when I pointed out things in nature to them, whether it was on coastlines or in, uh, or in the desert or in, in agricultural lands. And I really realized how I'd lost touch with nature from my days of being a marine oceanographer uh, and through my subsequent 20 years of business. Um, and that was a turning point for me. I realized that I wanted to get closer to the environmental, uh, to, to closer to the, to the environmental crisis and closer to nature. But I wanted to marry that uh, uh, proximity together with my business experience. Now, in the preceding 10 years, I had also become quite a prolific angel investor, investing in early stage tech startups uh, across the world, but especially in Egypt. And the juxtaposition of tech startups and the you know brutal innovation that they come in and disrupt markets with, with the two industries I had just left, oil and gas and construction, which are really clunky legacy industries where innovation comes in with great difficulty um, and where you know the sense of urgency is not there, uh, was very dramatic for me. And it occurred to me that I wanted to raise uh, an investment fund to give oxygen to innovations that could scale and really deliver potent uh, impact at scale uh, within the climate and nature uh, debate. So the Climate Resilience Fund, what do you invest in specifically uh, and why? And I know also you're doing um, a very big work into driving awareness. So it, it would be really interesting to understand how you marry this and, and what is your focus? So there are two sides to the planetary health crisis, right? And I use that term very, very consciously because when we say climate change, uh, it is a narrow subset of the planetary health issue. Climate change is driven by pretty much a singular variable, which is uh, greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere that causes a insulation layer over the planet, which warms the atmosphere and all the weather pattern changes that comes with it. But while climate change is underway, there is also nature destruction on the way, which is a far less addressed aspect of the planetary health crisis. And it's one where uh, us as a fund, the Climate Resilience Fund, have decided to make our intervention. And the reason we think it's so important is because nature is sitting at the center of trillions of dollars of our economy. Think about you know, pharmaceuticals. The entire pharmaceutical industry largely at its core sits nature through farming. The, ag the, the food industry entirely sitting in farming. Timber, meaning construction. Um, I mean, I can, I can, the entire fashion industry, textiles, it's entirely underpinned by nature. And the central premise of our fund is that we receive ecological goods and services for free, right? I mean, when, when you look at your mobile phone, uh, you know, mining companies go out and mine for metals and minerals and, um, uh, you know, and the like. And although they pay taxes to the countries where they operate and it costs them a lot of money to mine, the product that they extract, essentially they take for free. 
right? And that, that's not questioned, you know, when you, when you extract lithium or gold or whatever, copper, you take that for free. We do the same with nature. We get pollination services for free. We get water cleaning services from nature for free. Uh, we get um, soil nutrient cycling for free. We get our rain for free. These are all ecological services that we get for free. Uh, unfortunately, we are overusing them. And actually, we spend a lot of money actively destroying the very services that we get. It's almost like the economy is subsidized by nature, and yet we insist on destroying our own subsidy. And therein, you know, uh, addressing that subsidy, addressing the value that nature gives us, and, uh, and, and finding helpful interventions within the economy to support nature and let it continue serving us is where the Climate Resilience Fund sits. Uh, and um, the lowest hanging fruit for us in that respect sits within agriculture and food systems, and that's where we invest. I love the way how you you highlight all these free services that we get from Mother Nature. Myself, I've never seen seen it this way. So thank you for for putting it in in a different perspective. You've mentioned the importance of agriculture, and this is something we discussed previously when when we started uh, discussing with you our new uh, regenerative agriculture uh, program. Um, I, I would love to understand from you um, why regenerative agriculture is so important and what are the environmental, social, and economic impacts. And regenerative agriculture is something that's coming up now into the, the, the radar. Some people are talking about it, but I think it would be really interesting to hear it from you. How do you see this? Um, and, and why you're more invested in it. So regenerative agriculture is a buzz phrase, right? It's a catchword. Uh, it's kind of a bit like sustainability. You know, it means many, many things. And eventually people start self-defining it. And as they self-define it, they simplify and dumb it down until we don't really know what we're talking about anymore. Um, so I try to not use the term regenerative agriculture anymore. But let me tell you where you know, what, what the root cause or what the opportunity is that the term regenerative agriculture tries to speak around. If you go back uh, two, three hundred years and then the thousands of years before that, farmers farmed in a way that worked hand in glove with nature. They worked together with fungus and understood the role of bacteria um, and understood that you don't turn your soil over every year just to kind of bring the goodness that's deep down up to the surface because it actually takes many, many, many years for that goodness to get there in the first place. You understand the role of worms and insects and roaming animals on your land. And you understand that you don't farm the same crop over and over again. There's a rotation program, you know, the ones that we all learned about in school from the global north were, you know, first you plant, I don't know, wheat, then turnips, then barley, then I think it was clover. There's a, there's a program that you rotate. But what came about sort of in the last 50, 60, 70 years was an agricultural revolution where we basically discovered synthetics, synthetic fertilizer, herbicide, fungicide, where you realize it's so much easier and so much more predictable the crop that you can get if you just rid us of fungicides and herbicides. You know, for the most part, they deliver good results, but uh, occasionally they're a nuisance. You know, pests and, 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 and fungus and so on can be, a, uh, can be a nuisance to crop and it can create some variability in crop. So let's just kill that all off and just plow the land full of synthetic fertilizer and look, it produces yield after yield after yield. The problem is that over those 70 years, the soil has become less and less uh, nutrient rich because we've killed off everything in it. The seeds that we've had to farm in this land have all become the same. So you get no kind of natural resistance in the crops. The land is full of synthetics, you know, synthetic, uh, uh, you know, uh, everything from uh, antibacterial, which is basically antibiotics, which we then end up consuming. And what we're left with is land that is slowly dying of any kind of ecological life. It's producing food that's both unhealthy and reducing our resistance, our resistance to disease. And slowly, land is being degraded to the point of being unproductive across the global north. Um, and so the movement of regenerative farming is basically saying, let's stop that. You know, there was a way that we used to farm that perhaps was slower and it didn't produce as pretty a tomato or as reliable a crop every year of wheat. But ultimately, 
there was a future for the soil. Regenerative farming is a large and complex suite of farming practices. So let's just say, you know, nature positive or biologically correct farming practices is, is anything that reverses the trend that I just discussed. And when we do those things correctly, we both get healthier cropped, we get higher disease tolerance and, uh, and, and disaster or, or extreme climate tolerance, but we also get massive carbon sequestration. I mean, unthinkably large carbon sequestration in our land. So that is what people are talking about when they say regenerative farming, but the term regenerative is, is being misused to a point where it's gotten confusing now. Uh, there's a cup, there's a couple of, uh, pillars or verticals or themes that we invest in, right? So we like investing in precision agriculture. So this is agricultural technology that allows farmers to use fewer and very targeted inputs. You know, if you must use a synthetic uh, pesticide, at least use it in the absolute bare minimum quantity that you must use and in these zones. When you use water, you know, use satellite technology and artificial intelligence to understand exactly where you're watering, how much and when. Um, if you are looking for disease in your crop, uh, you know, use heat maps uh, to understand exactly where the crop is rather than just spraying uh, your pesticide everywhere. So that's precision farming. Uh, another product or another vertical that we like to invest in are interesting new food groups. So insect protein in particular, we think is extremely important as a substitute to animal meat um, because of the carbon footprint and, and nature impact of, of animal meat for human consumption um, and for animal consumption, by the way. I mean, there are a lot of destructive practices used to feed the animals that we eat, whether it's fish, chicken, cattle, and so on. And here we think insects, uh, marine, uh, marine farmed products, uh, so that means zero freshwater products, uh, are all interesting alternatives to the existing uh, food groups. And, and because our focus is very much in Africa, where there are, um, you know, millions of farmers who are farming products that we were taught to farm by our colonizers, but actually are not natural uh, products for us to farm. You know, we farm rice, where there are local alternatives to rice. We farm wheat, whereas we have alternatives to wheat. You know, we farm soy, whereas actually there are local, more endemic, more naturally resilient alternatives to those, but we forgot how to farm them because our colonizers didn't want us to farm those who they wanted us to farm what they wanted to eat. So that's another, that's another group that we're interested in. Uh, we're very interested in investing in data, intelligence, and technology that will support corporates in measuring their nature footprint. Because we're so certain that there's a movement coming in reporting your nature footprint, correcting your nature footprint, improving it, uh, that will need to be underpinned by data. You know, the science-based targets initiative will give us science targets. How do we measure that we're on target? Technology and hardware and software will be needed. We're investing in that. When we come back, Hossam breaks down the funding instruments in the climate space and why he feels COP27 fell short of his expectation. I wanted to take a minute and tell you about the Priceless Planet Coalition launched by our partners MasterCard. The coalition aims to restore 100 million trees around the world by 2025. You can visit the Priceless Planet Coalition website in our show notes to find out more and join the movement. Thank you to MasterCard for their support of Forward Talks and GoBook. Welcome back to my conversation with this episode's climate leader, Hossam Alam. When you're talking about financing, um, what are the options today? I mean, you talk about, you know, funding a nature economy, uh, basically. What are the financing options that are available today? And at the same time, are carbon markets a way to, to finance? So um, I think we've seen financing instruments in the climate space evolve very much. You know, initially, a lot of government grants were needed, then concessional capitals, so very low interest bearing uh, loans, and gradually, the energy transition starts to become profitable in its own right and attract specialist investors that accepted the risks associated with that industry and the rewards that that industry yielded. The risks and rewards emerging from nature are still unclear, largely because the product that you're buying 
is also not completely clear. I mean, with, with renewable energy, it's sort of easy. You're buying power, right? Which is something that there's already a ready market for and which we want and continue to want more of. Gradually, the world will realize, uh, aided by some uh, phenomenal efforts that are being run globally by governments and civil society, the value of nature and its importance to our to our industry and a a price will be placed on on those ecological goods and services and there will be stakeholders who pay for it and i predict that the first customers who will be paying for it will be the large corporates recognizing that the nature that they consume if it is at risk then their existence is at risk and so they will start paying for those ecological goods and services so that's the first source of financing customers buying risk protection measures by conserving and protecting their nature. Where there isn't an obvious customer link, I do think carbon markets are an important tool. Now, carbon markets are highly imperfect, but they're still a very potent and with a very high potential uh, product and currency that exists today. The intention and the philosophy behind it are sound, uh, but of course there are tweaks that are needed to make it you know, uh, applicable and relevant. Uh, and 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 um, and credible. Uh, and I mean, we're all reading articles about how users are being caught either red-handed uh, lying about their carbon uh, offsets and insets, uh, and in other times just having overestimated or misestimated their their carbon footprint. Again, it's imperfect, but it's underway. Uh, it is anchored around one single variable, and that is carbon. Um, and it needs to be that at the moment, not because that's the extent of the problem, but because that's the extent of our imagination. We are not more sophisticated than to understand this one variable carbon and to measure it. Um, but that, you know, I, again, I predict that that will be the currency for things like nature and biodiversity for a while until nature biodiversity uh, evolve their own currency. But increasingly, I think that there will be stakeholders, whether they're governments, NGOs, uh, foundations, and individuals who just feel instinctively the importance of nature to themselves, to their own existential survival, and that they will start to pay for it. And that would be a source of capital. And once that starts to flow, then you can have the same kind of momentum that you had in renewable energy that proved what the risks were, how manageable they were, how you could make money off it, what the sort of return profiles of it were. The space will become proven once money starts to flow into it, exactly as happened with renewable energy. How do you ensure the the, the balancing act between um you know, impact-driven funding and uh, ROI for investors. Businesses are looking and, and investors are looking at, you know, a return. This is very clear. And, and, and sometimes investing in nature, how, how do you make that link and, and ensuring the impact? That's a difficult question because it's very sensitive to what do you mean by impact? If by impact you mean doing good, then in principle, there's no conflict between doing good and making money, uh, right? I mean, people are investing in education all over the world and making profits. People are investing in clean energy all over the world. People are investing in food uh, and feeding people and making a lot of money and everybody's happy. Why is that? You know, why is it that providing clean water in the Nordics is not considered impact, but providing clean water in some parts of Africa is considered impact? The difference is that it has not been proven to be commercially viable in some parts of the world, whereas it has been proven to be commercially viable in other parts of the world. So for me, and this is very specifically my opinion, the definition of impact is delivering a crucially important service that hasn't yet shown its commercial viability. That for me is delivering impact. And therefore, the tension that exists is that it isn't commercially viable yet, it isn't investment grade yet. So for me, impact investing, and you know, I run an impact fund, it is finding the right balance of uh, investments or tools or business models that advances uh, agendas from being uninvestable to borderline investable to becoming investable, right? So it's making those brave investments at, you know, pu putting in the effort and the attention to advance industries so that they become investable. You know, renewable energy was not investable 30 years ago. Today, it's highly investable. Effort and money and brain power went into getting it there. And the same has to happen across many impact agendas, whether it's water supply to areas that don't have clean water or education or, you know, more uh, biologically friendly farming uh, or so many other things. Um, and really, it just requires commercially astute individuals to 
uh, apply their brain power to topics of developmental importance and doing the work to get them there. I love the word brave. <laughs> it, it it takes a lot of courage. I think for, from both from from you from your investors to to move in 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 this in this ecosystem. But um, interestingly enough, I mean, uh, COP twenty eight is is coming to the UAE, and as you may know, in Egypt, it was the first time last year that there was a, a food. Uh, pavilion and uh, they're coming back to 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 the to cop again this year for the second time and we're going to have the food for climate pavilion and i think a lot of the the things you mentioned and and um related to food and agriculture will be will be quite uh, a, an important topic to that will be brought to the forefront are you planning to come to dubai for the for cop don't know yet i'm not sure of the value that we can add nor gain from attending. And uh, I have mixed feelings about the COP uh, that I saw here in Egypt. It's interesting because I, I can see how passionate you are and, and, and how much you know about what is the right thing to do in terms of sustainability, in terms of um, climate action and, 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 and funding, how invested you are personally in, in into this. But somehow I, I can see underlying some maybe um, pessimistic views on maybe uh, not having enough action around you, not having policies or frameworks or more support from, from, a, from a global point of view. Is there anything you are optimistic about? Let, let me comment on my pessimism and then talk to you about what I am optimistic about. It's true that you know we are a private equity fund investing in early stage ventures and the companies that we invest in if they go on and succeed and are adopted you know their products and services are adopted at scale objectively that will move economies but all of this is negligible when compared to the scale of pollution and devastation that is carried out daily by some of the largest industries around the world it's easy to set targets like net something by 2030 and net something else by 2050. You know, it's easy to mention a target. If you're going to miss it, it's pointless. And anyway, 2050 is far, far too far a, a, a target to set. And so, I mean, we know that there is effluent being thrown into water systems and waterways, fresh and marine all over the world. We know that there are phenomenal quantities of emissions being blasted into the atmosphere from oil and gas operations and dirty power plants all around the world. I mean, just phenomenal. And there's really no work that me or the entire private equity industry can do that counters that. That has to stop. Don't get me wrong. I think that there are wonderful opportunities to be seized from conferences like these. And there was a lot of uh, very self-congratulatory initiatives that were launched at COP27 in Egypt. Uh, mostly by large businesses uh, seeking out new uh, investment opportunities. Uh, and as I say, the energy transition and decarbonization agenda is extraordinarily important, but also presents a wonderful uh, investment opportunities for companies. But um, to use, to focus on a word that you picked up on during our conversation, they don't seem to be terribly brave initiatives. It's basically plowing money into uh, you know, markets that are proven, like energy markets, and selling a product that they know that there's demand for. I would love to see some absolutely radical uh, commitments being uh, being made by some extremely powerful and potent players. For example, let's talk about, let's no longer talk about net zero, let's talk about absolute zero. We will be an absolute zero emissions industry by 2030. That would impress me. That would be a, a catalyzing impetus for the global oil and gas industry to think, oh my God, I mean, is that even possible? If they can do it, we have to try to be something that resembles that, uh, rather than targets that are 20 years into the future when we don't know if, if any of us are alive then. So, I mean, that's, that, that's kind of where the pessimism comes from. Um, but where my source of optimism also comes from is this, and it is that if we can collectively rally around nature and really just stop fighting nature, stop actively harming and, and preventing nature from doing what it does for us and has done since the start of humanity 
and for a couple of hundred million years before humanity, if we could just kind of make room for it to do what it does, I think we will be blown away by the momentum with which it can recover the mess that we've made. If, if we just sort of make space and watch it, monitor it, measure its ability to heal itself, sequester that carbon, recover that biodiversity, um, clean our waterways by itself. We don't have to do the work. It will do the work. We just have to make way for it. I think we will be blown away by how quickly, how potently it, it corrects and gets it right first time because it's had hundreds of millions of years of practice, right? We keep trying to correct our own messes and very often getting it wrong again and again and again. Nature doesn't do that. It gets it right first time. Uh, and if we can stop fighting it, um, I think it will come back and serve us as it has done you know, since the start of humanity and at speeds that we can't imagine. I think we, we might be able to imagine it if we think about what happened during COVID. It, it, that was just maybe a 0.001% of what nature is capable of doing, but we all remember how nature was thriving when we were all at home. Um, but again, as you said, you 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 had you had your moment uh, thinking about how to launch your impact fund during COVID, and and I hope really uh, more people are are ready to you know take action in any way possible into supporting nature um, more than uh, than anything else. So thank you so much. Uh, I really hope to see you in Dubai in uh, in November, and hopefully we will all be you know, uh, blown away by what is going to happen here and, and, and the decision that uh, the decisions that will be taken. So again, uh, this is an invitation to, to come to Dubai and, and hopefully also share all your experience and the, the beautiful work that you're doing. Inshallah, it'll be a very successful conference. And I really, uh, I mean, I hope that we will be pleasantly surprised. Thank you, Sam. You can find out more about the Climate Resilience Fund via the link in our show notes. Thank you for joining me today. Forward Talks is brought to you by Goombook in partnership with MasterCard. I'm Tatiana Antonella Beya and this episode was produced by Samantha K. Ruz, Anurada Patacharya, Janelle Lopez and Chirag Disay. See you again soon. Mm-hmm.